It's six o'clock in London. It's 1 p.m. in New York, 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 10 a.m. in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world today. My name is Patrick L. Young. We are on to Series 17, Episode 1 of the IPO Vid Livestream. In total, that makes Episode 97. So, $250 million has already been written off by the ASX. No sooner did they do so over their failure to implement digital asset software for their, well, at one time viewed as revolutionary blockchain-based settlement system, replacing the old chess infrastructure. Now, the users have totted up their losses, trying to keep up with the ASX's failed innovation, and that number comes to... $250 million. As the old saying goes, $250 million Australian dollars here, $250 million Australian dollars there. Sooner or later, we're going to be talking about real money. Meanwhile, as well as ASX writing that off, the Johannesburg Bourse finds itself in a remarkable conundrum, which really does leave us wondering whether we're in the 21st century. The South African state has failed to such a degree that they can no longer guarantee electricity for their citizens. I mean, this is South Africa we're talking about, full of energy. It's not Haiti or somewhere like that where they've got a near civil war going on. Nonetheless, the South African state has failed to such an extent that electricity is no longer being reliably provided. Thus, the JSE group is, well, they have to be applauded. They're preempting the problem with a circa one week supply of diesel to power in emergency generators as the South African grid collapses. What an incredible thing to be saying in the 21st century. Finally, something that is great news for the 21st century, we are delighted to see that our old friend, former European NASDAQ exchange Supremo, Hans Ole Jochumsen, is joining the board of Euronext Clearing as an independent director. That's got to be a win-win for all parties. Great news from Hans Ole. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is a fabulous and wonderful Professor Albert Menkfeld. He's going to be discussing non-standard errors in markets. Albert Menkfeld is Professor of Finance at the Free University of Amsterdam and a fellow at the Tinbergen Institute. He has taught, lectured, been involved with a multiplicity of great academic institutions around the world. In 2002, for example, he received a Tinbergen PhD from Erasmus University in Rotterdam. He's been on visiting positions for multiple years at various US schools, such as New York University, Wharton and Stanford. Albert's research agenda is focused on securities trading, liquidity, asset pricing and financial econometrics, and has been widely published in leading financial journalists, journals. For three years in a row, he's been the best publishing Dutch economist, according to the Economental 40, published by the ESB in 2020, 2021 and 2022. So here he is on the crest of a wave, ladies and gentlemen. Albert, welcome to the show. Where in the world are you today? I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be there. I'm in, uh, in Haarlem, uh, Holland. Uh, this is my home office and I uh, broadcast often from here, uh, classes and, you know, and things like this. Fantastic. It's wonderful to hear from you. I do believe you're the first person we've actually spoken to in the show in all 97 episodes who's been based in the Netherlands. So it's a delight to be breaking some new ground there. So tell me a little bit about your background. I mean, how did you get into academia? And in fact, how did you get into financial academia, Albert? So I, I studied econometrics in, uh, in Rotterdam, uh, worked for a few years for the Dutch uh, uh, airline, uh, KLM. Uh, so it was exciting at the time, this is late 90s, uh, to, um, to work for, for a company like that and, and get to travel uh, the world for, uh, for, for, for <laughs> basically 5% of, uh, of, of, of uh, airfares. Um, but I grew a little bored uh, intellectually, uh, I mean, at the, at the company, it was more of the same thing. And then I decided to go back to academia and study uh, financial markets close up because I was really interested in, for example, for this company, KLM, it was uh, trading both in, the, in Amsterdam and in New York, 50% uh, of volume in both markets. And people were asking, like, which market uh, really drives the value of this, of this company? Is it? 
Is it you know the hometown uh, Amsterdam? Uh, uh, you're next year, or, or is it really the New York Stock Exchange where all the uh, world's uh, largest companies are trading? Uh, so I grew fascinated by the question, and I started the PhD thesis uh, uh, zeroing in on that question. Well, that actually is a very interesting question. I'm not sure, was there a resolved answer? I mean, there you are, you're in Amsterdam, probably the world's oldest organized bourse, and at the same, or at least certainly continuous organized bourse. And then you've also got the New York Stock Exchange, the powerhouse pretty much of the Western world's markets. What was the ultimate result? Who drove the stock price? For you know, this one hour, uh, and sometimes two hours due to daylight savings, uh, where both markets are open at the same time. And that's really interesting because now you get to see like which, uh, which exchange uh, is pulling the price in the, in the direction where it's going to stay. Uh, and broadly speaking, it, it, it differs across uh, uh, stocks, uh, Dutch stocks. Uh, I forget which one actually is, uh, is left from, from which exchange. It's been a long time ago. Uh, but it was interesting to see that it wasn't a, 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 a one-size-fits-all for all these Dutch, uh, Dutch mm -hmm. stocks. Mm -hmm. Shell, I remember, was mostly driven by the Shell from, uh, from the New York Stock Exchange, uh, KLM right. also, but it didn't go for all the uh, cross-listed Dutch stocks. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly very interesting. I, mean, I suppose the thing about Royal Dutch Shell is it was so distributed in terms of where it was actually involved in oil processes. I can understand how that was driven from America. Not, I'm not trying to de degrade in any way KLM, which is an incredible global airline and hits way above its weight uh, pro rata, given the, given the size of, of the Netherlands and the population of the Netherlands. But it's fascinating to see how they're driven. In fact, we were discussing just a couple of shows ago about options markets. And it's very interesting to see today how how European stocks, when it comes to their options, if they've got options in the USA, there certainly seems to be a lot of evidence that the volume and everything about the, the trading of those options is actually driven in the USA. And I think a good example there's the one I was talking about, which was Ferrari, where race options in the USA are super liquid and trade an enormous amount, whereas at Borsa, Borsa Italiana, they're relatively illiquid. Fascinating. So, so you you find this interesting driver of why was the share price running on on different ways, and you were looking at that, and you started investigating it. And so, how did you how did you then advance your career from doing a PhD to actually stepping into working in academia? So, at the, at the time, I was um, uh, so the first few years I spent basically uh, working at the airline. I struck a deal with them that I could work half of my time uh, on, the, on my dissertation in Rotterdam at Erasmus. Half of the time I'd be uh, uh, fielding questions from analysts following KLM. And at the time it was the only stock uh, that, that you could trade in the US uh, getting exposure to the European airline industry. KLM was mm -hmm. the only one that was cross-listed at the NYC, which is why it generated the volume that it did and probably why uh, it was so leading uh, in terms of price discovery, as, as we call it. Um, as I became fascinated, I'm still working on this, this type of, uh, of question today. Um, and, and to, to uh, uh, you yeah, when, when you introspect and you find that, you know, what, 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 what you get most excited about uh, during the day, uh, since I was doing both jobs, it was really, uh, you know, having the time uh, to, to, to dive deep into uh, more statistical econometric questions on how you would actually do that if you get prices and and quality is traded in, in two exchanges. And these days you have not only multiple exchanges, you have all these off exchange venues trading all of these securities. Uh, and so it's, 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 it's even more important today to get the, the right techniques uh, or, or statistical models to detect which market is really uh, responsible for what percentage of, uh, of, of value uh, discovery or price discovery. Um, so, so your question was, how did I get from there to here? Well, I, I, I found that I, I was driven. By, I basically graduated from Erasmus, and then I spent some time in the U.S. Um, uh, educating myself further on, on frankly, the economics, because we, we, I think we're decent in Holland in terms of econometrics and statistics, but I was missing uh, more in-depth uh, knowledge on on actual economics. I was doing uh, auditing many courses at Stanford and at Wharton um, and at NYU. Uh, and then at the same time, I was working on my, uh, on, my, on my research. And eventually, after a few years, maybe almost a decade, I went back to Holland and I became full professor here at the Freie Universität 
and, and I've been um, mostly doing research ever since. Really very interesting, but it's, it's also fascinating, as you say, how you can spend so much time studying economics in the US, where there is a, a remarkably strong body of, of research and discussion across not just the three universities you mentioned, but the whole system. Um, and also, I mean, very interesting, because obviously you started your study at the very early age of electronic trading, you, your doctorate, I mean, you then basically graduate before we have these newfangled and wonderful things like MIFID and so on. So you could see in the USA competition amongst equity platforms, but we didn't get the same sort of thing happening in Europe until already effectively the mid 2000s. Right. And you might remember the, the first uh, post um, MIFID move was the LSE. Uh, you know, trying to get foot on the on the continent by uh, introducing euro sets, uh, so uh, it's basically their system uh, trading uh, European securities. And the most um, 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 uh, friendly country to uh, to that uh, second exchange really was Holland. Uh, people are here mm -hmm. uh, not too happy with the uh, with the innovation of of, of, of Euronex and the fees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the LSE tried it. With Eurosets, and uh, and they allowed me to look into uh, what happened when you had that second exchange trading Dutch securities, but now you know in the same time zone. And now you sort of see that I was uh, very happy to to get the data and actually study uh, you know the way the, the market evolved. Yes, and it's been an incredible evolution throughout the course of your career. And in fact, I think that's where we first met was at one of the various FASE conventions where you've been speaking, the Federation of European Securities Exchanges. So, I mean, you spent this amazing decade in the USA. When you actually came back full time to, to live in Holland, it, it must have been fascinating how the markets had moved on and things were much more sophisticated than they'd been, say, when you started your PhD. So, well, sophisticated. Um, I'd like to challenge. Or complex, you. I'm perhaps. Not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, complex has ever been. You know, if you go back centuries, and I started, uh, I took delight in going through a book written by Josef de la Vega, uh, describing the details of how the exchange worked in the 17th century. Uh, and you get all this stuff. People were were, were trading derivatives. There were um, yes. uh, there was speculation. There was some people were more informed than others. Um, there was uh, there was off exchange trade. It was all that stuff. Uh, yes, we've repackaged it, and, and you're right. To some extent, it's more complicated because uh, the, 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 the information technology uh, made everything so much faster, and, and you could you could work at such larger scales. Uh, but you'd be surprised on how much of the uh, of, 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 of the markets remained the same in terms of core in terms of fundamentals. And I, actually, I think you're absolutely right in the sense of mentioning that book, which I think is an absolute must read and has always been a must read in my view, Joseph de la Vega's Confusing to Confusionis. It's, it's incredible. I mean, it's a, it's a stunning book. You're quite right. I mean, Amsterdam was trading all manner of derivatives. In fact, it was quite funny because uh, Richard Sander, you know, the father of financial futures, he and I have been joking about this for decades because he would ring up in the 90s and say, oh, I was just, you know, I went to the CBOT floor the other day and it's incredible. Go to page, whatever, 46. That guy, that De La Vega is talking about. He's actually in the bond pit now. It's amazing. He must be 360 years old, but he still only looks sort of 25. And, and it's true because, I mean, the dynamics certainly of the floor trading didn't change more or less throughout that period of time. But also, as you say, the product range was incredible because we were actually doing road shows, the, the doc and I, promoting life's single stock futures when they first came out in the late 90s. And it was great because everybody's talking about this whole new product, single stock futures. And it's, we didn't want to point out to people too much unless we were having a few drinks afterwards that actually there's not a lot new under the sun. I mean, those single stock futures, you could buy them in Amsterdam 300 years ago, but just these days, they're a new thing. Um, but, but it's very interesting, as you say, the complexity. One thing that always gets me is stock options, I mean, stock equities trading. Because I come from the futures business originally, futures options and OTC derivatives. And it's just horribly complex. I mean, the process, I mean, you've only got two choices. You buy the share or sell the share. Okay, you can sell short, but it's essentially buy or sell. But yet the amount of complexity that seems to go into this processing drives me nuts. But that's just probably a whole, whole other area of discussion. Um, 
But your point's well made. I mean, I mean, there's nothing really that new under the sun in terms of the general area of product, the general area of process. It's just how it's been processed over time has changed. Um, so what really drove your research when, when you started uh, uh, your professorship? Was it thanks to MIFID that you find sort of anomalies and you're interested? Was it due to exchanges coming and asking you questions? Some other form of intellectual curiosity? No, you just mentioned the futures business, um, and 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 that's where we interacted. I just looked looked up our, our interactions over the years. It was almost seven seven years ago when we when we first interacted over clearing, um, and uh, yeah, the, the the fact that the, the MIFID was coming in and the Europeans were taking regulation uh, seriously for the entire continent um, made um, um, the uh, you know the. the, the, the the structure of the, of the infrastructure of the securities markets uh, come into the limelight. And, and, and the important part of the infrastructure, also post the uh, global financial crisis, is clearing. And, and I think that, uh, that we, we did a, good, uh, a few good um, uh, iterations over the regulation there, um, and playing vanilla uh, derivatives, uh, you know, being centrally cleared, I think is, a, is generally a, a good idea. Uh, but you need to understand that if, if you do that, if you bring all of the risk, counterparty risk, into a, a single entity, uh, then um, it's not that uh, your systemic risk is gone. It's, it's basically consumed up by that single entity. And, and so you better take another look and a third look at the way risk is being managed there. Uh, and you know, risk management, that's uh, maybe, maybe it's, it's going too far for this for this talk, but, but uh, collateral uh, must uh, uh, must be uh, lining up with the with the exposure that your you, you as a clearing member um, create for the uh, for the CCP for the for the central clearer. Um, and, but then you need to be able to measure that exposure really really well. And, and there was uh, um, uh, one um, uh, clearing agency here. Uh, who was uh, particularly interested in having uh, me uh, take an outside look in on the way they, um, they calculated margins. And, and that's, that's, that was the start of a few papers on, uh, on clearing, which I still think is an under-researched topic and so important mm -hmm. uh, for, um, for, for, for the reliability of our entire infrastructure, really. Totally agree with you. And, and I mean, the whole business of central counterparty clearing, where, by the way, I think the underlying providers do a remarkably good job. But yes, it, the, the sense of what you say, putting everything into one big bucket. I mean, my argument was always what I called the, the Homer Simpson supermodel buffet scenario, which was if you have a an all-you-can-eat buffet and effectively you're next door to the elite model agency and all the supermodels turn up at lunchtime. That's great because you know that there's a very, very finite amount of food that all these young ladies are going to be eating because they all want to keep their figures. The difficulty is when you suddenly open that buffet up and you realize that on the other side of you, you've got Moe's Tavern and Homer Simpson's going to come in after he's had a couple of beers and his effective ability to eat food is essentially infinite, as is that of his friends, suddenly you've got a very, very different set of risk parameters. You can understand now why I'm clearly not an academic like Albert, ladies and gentlemen, because I have no citations for what I've just discussed. But on the other hand, I think it breaks it down a little bit. So you're right. I mean, clearing has not really been, been given as much as it deserves. And actually, it was quite interesting, wasn't it? I mean, we were talking because uh, all those seven years ago, I mean, 2007, 2008 came as such a shock to so many people. And yet it was quite feasible when people write each other lots of IOUs that there could be a problem because we can actually see that from well, I can name a couple of Dutch crises of several hundred years ago that would, would manage to help us there, let alone the rest of the world who've all had the same things. So you, you have, however, I mean, in recent times, you've been moving into this process. And it's very interesting. Break it down for me. I mean, the title of today's show, Non-Standard Errors in Markets. Um, explain yeah. to us where that comes from and what you were, you were doing. Yeah, so th this is what we've been talking about so far. Uh, was my, and that's where we intersect really. Um, uh, you know, the interest on uh, where markets are going, market infrastructures, um, and and at some point, uh, you know, th there was a uh, the econometrician in me uh, woke up uh, when uh, when thinking, uh, you know, after uh, maybe two decades of research, 
of uh, maybe there's an, an uncertainty in, in, in the outcomes of, of, of all analysis we do, not only us academics, but also many of our listeners today who are quants uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. Um, when, you, when you go about uh, measuring a particular um, uh, uh, phenomenon you're interested in, let's say, uh, let's, let's pick one um, important futures today, which is the Eurostox uh, 50 index futures. Um, suppose you want to, for the two decades that, uh, that we're in now into the, into the century, you want to see with all the innovation that's been happening, and, and Eurex, quite frankly, is is in the forefront in many ways of uh, the way they've been innovating the markets. What is the, what is the outcome? What is the, um, the result of that? And what, what, you, what you'd like to do, for example, is see market efficiency. Uh, so what the, what the trend of market efficiency was over the first two decades. Or if, if bid ask spreads, or, or more precisely realized bid ask spreads, have they, have they improved uh, over the years? Uh, have they improved by uh, by one percent per year, like reduced by one percent per year, or or, or two percent, or five percent, or have they gone up? Um, what and what happened to intermediation? If if you have all these vehicles uh, available to you as a trader, uh, like algorithmic trading uh, technologies, maybe uh, it, you can work your large order through the market on your own using your algorithm, and you don't need the broker so much, so maybe intermediation has gone down and more people trade directly with one another. So what happened there? And that, those are the trends I think that we're all interested in, not only acad academics, uh, but, uh, but, but lots of people out there. But when you, when you, want, when you go about uh, calculating that trend, uh, you make all kinds of decisions. Um, you have to first decide what, for example, what to include? Do you uh, include rollover periods or, or no? Uh, what do you do with outliers? Um, uh, how, how do you uh, clean up your data? What statistical model are you going to use? Um, what part of the sample is, is really uh, of interest? All those decisions, uh, and we all know, um, you, um, since you must come to one number, uh, on all those forks in the road, you take left or right, and, and probably they're relatively unimportant individually. But you make so many decisions, which I experienced in my own research uh, that we talked about just now, but others must experience as well, uh, that they, they accumulate. And so um, uh, if you, Patrick, and I were doing the same analysis, and we were going through different paths, then it's of interest, like how much market efficiency, I might conclude that it's gone down by 4% per annum, and you might conclude it's gone down by 1%, or you may be concluded that it's gone up by, by 1%. And, and, and so we really want to know how, how large this dispersion is across analysis paths or, or, or across analysts when they, do this, when, they, when they study the same empirical question. Now, um, that type of uncertainty I've, I've been calling, I've been thinking about this non-standard area. So the fact that there's no standard path that we all agree on means that there is room for dispersion due to us, all of us taking a different path in the research trajectory. Um, and, and the size of the, you know, the dispersion that you get at the end of the, uh, of the path is, is, is of interest. And now, so that, that is conceptually what I've always been interested in. So we're very precise on standard errors, which is if you're interested in, uh, as an econometrician, estimating a particular uh, object, um, you and you get a finite sample, um, um, you, you you can estimate it, and you get some error because because the the sample is finite, uh, and and that error is uh, is called uh, the standard error. It's like a statistical error, you do the sampling error essentially. No. In addition, there is this non-standard error that creates uncertainty. Uh, long story short, what we've been doing in the COVID period, really, where, where everybody was, uh, was uh, to some extent bored by another day at home and, and nothing, nothing happening, we've decided to launch this, this, this project where, where, whereby we would really do that. So, so let's make that data available to, uh, to many research teams and, and see uh, what they come up with. And, and, that's, and that's what we did. So, okay trying to get my head around this here for, for the simplicity of, of all of our viewers and uh, it's really really fascinating but it strikes me 
So there are clearly standard errors, which we can we can appreciate. But then we get into this area of non-standard areas uh, errors, and and that sounds to me a little bit like. I don't know if you've ever read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, where the philosophers threaten to go on strike. And one of their demands is the magnificent line, we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty, which I think is possibly the greatest union demand of all time and, and, and thoroughly mimics actually the Britain of the 1970s that it had obviously been based around. But it, it sort of, I'm trying to get my head around the idea that you have non-standard errors, but then is there a way that you can come up with a way to standardize non-standard errors, or are they already too derivative that it's that it's it's impossible to get everyone on the same page? So this is a great great question. I think, uh, and it's quite so. The whole material is new to me and and, and to many others, and 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 I'm still trying to get my head around it. But it's it's worth thinking about these things. Uh, and, and so we ran that experiment. We had uh, 164 teams the world over, uh, high quality teams, because a third of the teams had people published at the very top. For example, uh, many, many uh, full professors and associate professors on board, people working in this area. Uh, and we gave them uh, a, a data set that nobody's ever seen and, and nobody might ever get to see, which is uh, 720 million trade records in uh, Eurostox 50 index futures um, spanning 2002 to 2018. Um, and for all of these uh, records, you get to see who, who traded. Uh, so you get somebody taking the long side and the short side, but for those both those sides to the trade, you get to see if it was uh, an exchange member trading for their own pocket or, or for a client. So, so you really get at this notion of was, how much was um, yeah, intermediated uh, versus done for clients? And if you talk about realized bid ask spreads, you can decompose them into what was the realized bid ask spread for uh, clearing members and what was it for clients? And so they might, they might be separate trends. Um, so now, now to your question, um, like market efficiency is, uh, let's say market efficiency, people, people measured it. And, and uh, I brought two slides with me today. I'm trying to minimize slides because I, I think they're distractive, but, but, these, but these, these slides are sort of the core of the entire study. The first slide uh, shows you 40, um, for, the, for the six research questions, or you know, researchers call them hypotheses, what the outcomes were across the 164 research teams who independently did that study. Uh, and people, people you know, are all over the place in terms of market efficiency. Uh, most conclude that um, that it declined actually uh, over the uh, over the entire um, uh, two decades, which is the, the leftmost column here. Uh, so that's research team hypothesis one uh, efficiency, uh, and this is the annual percentage numbers. Um, so the so the median here. So these are box plots. Um, so the boxes they span twenty five percent to seventy five percent. And, uh, and, and in the middle of the box is a horizontal line, that's the median. Uh, and and you know, the median was minus 1% per annum uh, decline in market efficiency. Uh, and that's, that's already sort of surprising with all that's changed. Um, but, um, but, but what's more surprising is this huge uh, dispersion um, where um, the people are, you know, the, the interquartile range is somewhere between plus uh, a few percentage points to minus 10%. Um, now, your question is, can, is there a way to standardize? Uh, uh, could we sort of converge uh, on a number that's, uh, that's more of a consensus number? And the way this, this works in academia, and to some extent, I believe, outside of academia, is, is we get to see uh, each other's outcomes and discuss them in, in conferences, uh, at the water cooler, uh, in the in the bar, uh, etc. And, and then we, you know, when, when you when you walk away from such a presentation, um, you know, if I sit in a train back home or, or fly back home, I, I, I'm going. To, what's going through my mind is all these questions people asked and suggestions they did, and, and I don't believe that some of these suggestions are actually better than what I what I did, uh, or, or um, at least as good. And I'm, I'm and I'm thinking like. Out of all the suggestions, I might want to implement uh, the first uh, a, a few of them and improve my study. And so, and this is what we emulated in this in this experiment. So, not only did all of these teams do this, they 
they did this in the first stage. The second stage, they got feedback from senior uh, um, uh, colleagues who read their reports, uh, assessed their methodologies, and gave them constructive feedback. They did not have to implement it because they were co-author of the study no matter what. But if they believe they're reasonable, they could implement a re-report uh, the estimate for market efficiency, for example, in the first hypothesis. Uh, and then we published in the third round of you know, what were the top rated papers out of the 164 and showed them to everyone without showing the names. And in the final uh, stage, they could, uh, they didn't have to code anything. They could just, just, just pick a number that they ultimately, with all the information they had, was the truth on what market efficiency, in their view, the, like the best uh, estimator of market efficiency uh, change. Now, now what, is there a way to standardize non-standard error? Um, um, what we saw is a tremendous decline in the, in the dispersion, uh, like up to 50 percent, five zero percent across all of these stages. So all of this communication uh, does get us to agree uh, on a, a smaller range of outcomes. But what's interesting is we don't get to a single point. So that there's there's a persistent range, which I believe should we should take account of and report. Um, as you know, depending on which angle point you take, uh, which viewpoint you take, uh, you're gonna you're gonna end up. You know, I'm just making this up now, but but, but maybe you end up like minus a half percent and minus five percent of market efficiency uh, after all the review stages, all the uh, peer feedback stages. Well, then then that's important to know. Uh, so I believe that 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 um, I truly believe that the outcome on, uh, on all of these questions and research is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a range uh, rather than a single number. So these numbers can be a range, not a single number. I, I suppose I would have to profess to being a market charlatan rather than a fine, splendid, rigorous academic such as yourself. But I mean, financial markets have this habit of finding solutions that are very crude, but nonetheless, they kind of work. And I suppose the best one of that is when they're looking at estimates of what people say are going to be the next series of statistics, whether it's, you know, US unemployment, for example, on the first Friday of the month. And of course, the simple thing that somebody did there was took all of the, the different uh, numbers that all of the banks came up with and all their different analysts and then said, OK, put them all together, average them all out and we'll come out with a consensus average. Which, of course, is, is fairly appalling if you're one of the uh, particularly hard-working analysts who's come out with some outrageous out-of-left-field, possibly slightly beyond a sigma, beyond what everybody else thinks. But nonetheless, it provides a useful value. Um, I suppose it's probably an appallingly sacrilegious thing to suggest to all of these uh, rigorous academic teams around the world who are looking at this. But is it feasible to, to start thinking of the idea of taking these numbers and perhaps crunching together what all of the different people's results are and then saying, well, there's a kind of a, there's a kind of a central number, whether it's mode, mean, whatever, that gives us an indication? I think I think it's it's nice that you draw this parallel. And I, I agree with you. It's it's still useful uh, to have a single number. And, and, and maybe I would argue that the median is a very robust uh, location uh, estimator. Uh, it's it's least sensitive to outliers. So the median is a, is a, is a, is a number uh, that uh, that you'd uh, you'd want to see maybe if you have to put your um, uh, if if there's only space for one number uh, in the headline, that's the number that uh, you you'd pick. But hey. Uh, wouldn't it be useful to know that you know? The, the, take two different cases. Where, the, where the, one was the median uh, was uh, was uh, a median in a distribution that was highly dispersed, where um, uh, the, the first quartile was minus twenty five percent market efficiency decline, and the third quartile was was twenty five percent market increase uh, or market efficiency increase. Um, being case one, case two is uh, uh, it, it was. Uh, Minus uh, um, uh, 1%, but then the, the first quartile was minus 2%, and, and, and the third quartile, quartile was 0%. So, so I think these ranges uh, are going to give you a sense of how much uh, trust you need to put into that single number, or if there was a lot of uncertainty around it. Um, but, but so, so I would argue that maybe the median should be on the first page, but uh, the line next, the, the subtitles should really have that range because it's informative on uh, knowing how much uncertainty or non-standard error entered that particular median.
That's very interesting. I mean, I'm just throwing these things out because obviously I'm a trader with a very short term perspective on trying to understand things. So I'm always trying to get to the bottom of it rapidly. But um, OK, so so you you've done this study with this huge number of people. I mean, you're talking about they're studying 720 million trading records, you had 164 teams. So that got you what I mean, several hundred researchers, I suppose. Um, what was the most interesting feedback you had from amongst the researchers themselves when they saw the whole of the the whole of the research? So the, we, we did not uh, tell them uh, obviously uh, to uh, to not uh, color the outcome what we were going to do, uh, and in fact uh, we, we we thought up the entire analysis. So that so the paper in its first its original form was essentially carrying out whatever we, we thought up in uh, the year before uh, we started the experiment and we put that in a, in a safe. Uh, there is an uh, open science foundation in California uh, where you can put your plan in the safe so that um, you, you commit to doing that analysis. You, you minimize the degrees of freedom that you, you yourself might actually be, uh, be enjoying when you want to, you know, massage uh, the analysis in the direction that, that confirms your priors or, or, or what you think that people would want to read. Uh, so to keep it really pure, you want to settle on what you want to analyze and put it in the safe and commit before you execute the experiment. So we did that, we did the experiment, then we wrote the paper. And people thought uh, that we were going to report that median number that we just talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a crowdsourced um, study and, 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 one of, and the first one in economics or finance, uh, because it had been done in two years before in, the, in sociology, uh, where people were asked to, um, to analyze a data set where uh, the central hypothesis was uh, a football referee was he more prone to give for the same uh, type of foul, uh, uh, a yellow or red card to a, a player of darker skin color? Um, and so that, that was done there and it, it, it created a huge amount of interest. And it, it was published, I believe, in Science, which is very, the very top journal in, in all of science. And, and, mm -hmm. and since then, you see many of these multi-analyst studies uh, appearing. Um, um, so. So, so people were thinking that we would do uh, we focus on the median, but the focus really wasn't on the median uh, right from the beginning. It was on, on that range, on the uncertainty uh, that you get when you uh, when you ask uh, different people uh, to do to do essentially the same task. And so that was surprising to, to a lot of people, but that that set them thinking. Um, and and one of one of the other uh, things that came out was. Um, as I said earlier, uh, I, I was aware under which conditions I was working, and I was aware that I made these choices. And I was aware, therefore, that um, the outcome depended some on whether I took a left, center, or right decision each of the, of the four. But I had no idea on how these things would accumulate. Um, and I, and I, you know, I would think that they would be relatively minor. Um, and so we asked everybody also before we gave them uh, the feedback, like what, if you, if you sit down and think, and, and you know that more people are doing this particular task, if you think and, and, and you, you, about the dispersion that you'll see across all of those teams, uh, and that was an incentivized uh, research. So, so whoever got closest to the final uh, realized dispersion got, uh, I, I forget, something like, uh, uh, a coupon to buy something on Amazon in the amount of hundred dollars or so. Um, okay. But but but, but we, we put we incentivize people to think about this. Uh, people reported uh, that dispersion metric, and 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 one of the most surprising findings to many was the the actual dispersion was an order of magnitude larger than people's prediction of the dispersion. So all of us are relatively unaware of this tremendous uh, difference in outcomes uh, that you get when you ask people to honestly, uh, you know, to, to their own, uh, to calling on their own honesty to, uh, to estimate trends on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on markets. And, and quite frankly, this, this supersedes just acad academics because like you said, uh, analysts write about earnings. Um, the newspaper is full of analysis and, and charts and, 
And I believe that there's a huge null standard error on all of those. And, and this is just the beginning of it. I, I want to see how much the null standard error is, is. So, yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. So the, the known standard errors are essentially all around us in every aspect of financial markets, however we look at it. And therefore, it's very difficult for me, unless I've misunderstood, to see any area of research or analysis where non-standard errors don't creep in remarkably quickly. Is that fair? That's fair. That's absolutely fair. Yeah. So, now, so therefore, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, the, the only thought that I wanted to add is when, when you've done all of this um, and you, you pause for a moment and think, like, what does all of this mean? And I think this was, this is sort of what I'm reading into your mind when you, when I, when, when you ask this question, like, what, what, does this, what does this all mean? And how, we should, how should we go about doing research going forward? Uh, because, because it's kind of expensive for everything that we're interested in uh, to drum up 164 teams or 350 researchers mm -hmm. around the globe to do another study. Uh, and you know, on the back of a, uh, of a piece of paper, I did a calculation that you know, the amounts of resources that went into this project with all of these people spending the time that they did. Uh, this was in some sense a giant parallel processor, you know, with the 164 CPUs. Um, if, you put, if you add up all of that time, uh, you have uh, an FTE of 27 academic years. So it's, it's a full academic career that went into this project. Now, now, we can't do this type of analysis for everything that's out there to study. Um, so, but, but maybe we should think about it if we all agree what the, what the key questions are in, in whatever field of science we're, we're in, uh, maybe, maybe we, we agree on what those questions are. And for that, for those subset of, of very important questions, we might want to maybe not the 164, but, but at least um, maybe a dozen uh, reputable researchers doing independently a study of the same data set so that we get an estimate, uh, not only the median, but also the non-standard error. Okay, so so therefore, in some ways, you I, I'm listening here, and I'm sort of thinking it sounds a bit like football. You're going to have a sort of a super league of researchers, and then you'll have a series of other leagues of researchers who might be doing papers, and it'll be quite interesting to see how they all they all come out. Um, if we're looking at this whole process, though, is there a way over time? Do you think? maybe not to come up with a sort of an is the master agreement of non-standard errors, but at least to reduce the number of ways people interpret or interpolate non-standard errors to try and get a slightly more homogeneous process? I think, I think uh, that there should be um, lots of interaction. Um, Lots of interaction uh, in, in, in so academic conferences. I'm, I'm myself organizing the European Finance Associations Conference this year in Amsterdam in August. We will have two and a half days of uh, you know, almost 200 papers being presented, discussed. Uh, then we have online seminar series. Uh, then we have interactions like these. I remember we were sitting on a panel that you were chairing. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in Frankfurt, uh, where uh, we were talking about uh, high-frequency trading, uh, the pros and cons. There was a, a high-frequency trader on the panel. There was me as an academic on the panel, many others. You know, these type of interactions also help me uh, uh, judge if, uh, if my methodology of the way I measure things are, are accurate or if they're incomplete in some sense and adjust. And, and like I said, so the convergence is remarkable. And, and you know, relative to all the other multi-analyst studies that have been done, none of them in, in, in none, none of the fields of, of, of science have, have tried to go at that stage two, three, and four, where we measure that whether there's some sort of uh, convergence in, uh, in, in, in our um, uh, estimates when, after interaction. So we should have more, more of, the, of that type of interaction. Well, I think it's a great interaction. I'm only sorry, ladies and gentlemen, because of some internet problems, we've had to pre-record this show. So hopefully Flo will get their internet together one of these days and we'll be back to live streams. But I think it's very interesting what you say. I mean, it is great to have these interactions between practitioners and academics and so on. And certainly it's something that is a joy for economists and financial markets, as opposed to, say, historians, because it's quite difficult to dig up your subjects. But the interesting part uh, I see is 
actually something we haven't discussed, which is the expansion of the core data. Because if we were sitting here having this conversation in 1994, let's say, when the internet was only a fledgling thing and there were various, I mean, actually, you could do the whole World Wide Web in a day in a subject area without any difficulty whatsoever. It's very interesting how in those days we still had floor traded markets. We had lots of bilateral markets. Actually, a lot of the trading data that you're talking about was frankly rubbish. I mean, the exchange data was very good, but anything that was coming from the OTC markets was pretty poor. But even the exchange data, they're really only capturing one or two things. I mean, they weren't even capturing bid and offers offers in the United States of America's futures markets, for example. They were just giving you the last trade and there was some element of volume related to it, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas now, of course, I mean, the world has moved on because, well, we've had the good folks of BMLL on a couple of times talking about their, what is it, 16 petabyte lake of data that they've got on equities around the world and that's still expanding. So obviously the problem has grown if only because the amount of data that you can suddenly play with has grown pretty inexorably during the course of certainly, well, certainly my career that's that's spanned all the way back to the late 1980s. So what's interesting, that trend that you just identified with, with data sets expanding and, and more and more data becoming available, uh, data of quality, I should say, becoming available mm -hmm. for study uh, by, by people like me, but, 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 but frankly, many Many, uh, many others, and, and, and many, many listening in uh, today. Um, what, 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 you know, to an econometrician, what this tells me is that with larger samples, you reduce standard errors. You have better ability simply because the sample is larger to uh, estimate whatever uh, object you're interested in uh, learning about the data, it ask bits or whatever you're interested in. So standard errors going forward uh, become smaller and smaller. And, and so the trend really is, and I think this is the right moment in time to study these, is, is the non-standard error. Uh, that, that you don't necessarily you know, crash or, 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 or reduce by making, making samples larger. That, that really doesn't, you know, larger samples don't get you smaller non-standard errors. It's really a, a different type of, uh, uncertainty in, in estimates that you, you you can only tackle by uh, by measuring it and and and, and you know, discussing what the um, uh, what the different approaches are and what what uh, are, what the more reasonable ones are. That's very interesting, and and certainly, I mean, it is a fascinating issue because it is just a growing pain of suddenly being able to capture all of this electronic data, and I suppose therefore, I mean. It, I'm curious to know, what do you think is the next process? Because obviously you can't expect to keep doing studies, I suppose, that take up 27 academic years every time, because that is a... Yes, so I, I think it's 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 quite it's quite okay um, to uh, to keep uh, doing. I'm not arguing that, uh, it, and I agree, it's way too expensive to do uh, all of these studies in, in a multi-analyst uh, fashion, like multiple teams studying the same thing. It's quite okay to, for all of us to keep uh, exploring uh, research questions and hypotheses on data uh, ourselves and and uh, write reports about them, and and you know. I think the evolution of, uh, of knowledge on, on all of these dimensions, uh, if, if a, a particular topic becomes important enough, maybe that's a time where we want to, uh, or a trend becomes important or noticeable enough, where we want to involve uh, multiple teams rather than a single one to see what the, um, where, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the community uh, arrives at, what the median is and what the non-standard error really is. Uh, to see what, uh, what what's what's true about a, a particular trend, for example, um, um, and that's and that's I think where uh, where this is gonna uh, gonna go to. But uh, I'd be interested to look if we have this conversation ten years from now, what research will be like. Uh, but I'm convinced that it's going to be some elements of it. It's going to be multi-analyst type of, of research. Certainly, it seems fascinating. The multi-analyst way is a way forward. And therefore, I suppose, though, I'm going to ask you our standard final question and offer you an opportunity to have a single analyst answer. Where, Albert Menkfeldt, do you think the capital market revolution goes next? 
So this is, um, uh, unfortunately, I can't evolve all my uh, 300 plus uh, academics to, to get at this, uh, this question. Um, but when, when I think about these things and you know, the theme that we're covering today, uh, it, it, it'd be, um, we look at 10 years from now, what research is going to be like. We're not doing uh, research anymore on our own little machines. Uh, with the, uh, you know, this, this Mac books, et cetera, they'll be uh, in the museum. There'll, there'll be clouds of, uh, of uh, with repositories of data. And, but along with those clouds will be uh, code uh, that analyze this data uh, and then certified by different researchers, like uh, the, as you know, the most appropriate way. Uh, to go about analyzing a particular question. And then uh, when you bring in new data, let's take the next years of trading, um, you don't have to sit down and redo the analysis. It's basically already there uh, because you can run my algorithm or Patrick's algorithm or whoever other's algorithm to uh, recompute what the market efficiency was in 2024 and 2025. Uh, and, and, and that certification and, and, and evaluation of that particular code is going to be something that, uh, that's going to be indicative of, of how um, um, uh, well, well uh, established or accepted a particular type of algorithm is going to be. But uh, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's try and have this conversation again 10 years from now and see if, th if this prediction really came true. December 7th, December 7th, 2016, as fintech is being discussed at CE Impact here in Wrocław. December 7th, 2016, as fintech is being discussed at CE Impact here in Wrocław, a child is born. That child is going to live to be 130 years old. Their world is going to be unlike anything that we've ever seen before in history. They're born into an entirely digital world. When they get to the reach the age of 18, they're probably not even going to have a driving license because they'll have a driverless car. They're going to have incredible opportunities through nanotechnology and biotechnology and the whole world of finance. The way that they deal with their pension going forward, even whether or not they actually use a bank, those are all going to be radically different throughout the course of their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm terribly sorry about that. We are having problems with our flow internet. That has been a marvellous show with Professor Albert Menkfeld. Certainly when we get together to discuss this topic again. I hope it'll be sooner than 10 years time. We're going to be discussing something, Albert, but even if it's discussing what it is, well, all I can say is that by that stage, I hope that we've got better internet in order to discuss your single user studies, multi-user studies, and so on. This has been IPO vid 97. I want to say a huge thank you to our guest, Albert Menkfeld. We've been discussing non-standard errors in markets. Thank you also to our production team today, Fernando, Racy, and Jamil. My name is Patrick L. Young. We're going to be back next week with episode 98, which will be at the same time and the same place in cyberspace. Thanks for watching, ladies and gentlemen. This has been IPOVID97. Have a great week in blockchain, life, and markets.